You probably already know that it's not enough just to play the right notes if you want to make a great solo. It's not enough to know that you can play an A half diminished arpeggio over an F7. There are a lot of other things that have to be right as well in your solo for it to really sound great. And one way of working on this and checking out how a melody really works so that you can get those same things into your solo is to analyze compositions and also to compose lines yourself. At least that's one of the things that I do a lot that I find work really well for me to add some of the more vague or less obvious things to my playing. In this video I'm going to show you an exercise that I sometimes spend some time on that I find is really great for really checking out what is great about a melody and put it into my own playing by composing my own lines and using some of those same principles. My name is Jens Larsen. If you want to learn jazz and make music then subscribe to my channel and click the little bell notification icon next to the subscribe button. One of the most important and influential composers in jazz is probably Thelonious Monk. So in this video I'm going to take his blues straight note chaser and then I'm going to use that as a type of raw material that I can then build a lot of other lines from. Some of it's going to be just taking his phrases and then change them and look at how you can change them. But also later in the video I'm going to take a look at some of the things that I think are really really what makes this great and especially how and that goes for probably any monk tune almost how he's fantastic at using repetition and rhythmic displacement and well rhythm in general essentially straight note chaser is of course really just one phrase that's used as a motif and then moved around moved in the bar and also just moved through the changes of a blues i think originally it's in b flat uh, most people know it in F, so I'm also going to use it in F here. The main motif and the main phrase that is then repeated and developed throughout the whole theme is really just this phrase. Now, if you look at this phrase, essentially it's, it's a second inversion major triad, so in this case an F major triad. And then for the top note here, the A, we have a chromatic approach from two steps below. And you can of course just take that and then move that around, make some inversions and try something similar and see if you can make some nice melodies with that. That's pretty easy already. So instead of using the second inversion, we can use the first inversion. So that would be... And then I need to add the chromaticism. And I can of course do the same also with the root position. So we have um, this. And then if I add the chromaticism, so I need to approach the C from below. So. Then I have this, which is actually already just another cliche blues phrase. If I use one of these phrases to create a lick, that could be something like this. Another really useful technique that you find everywhere in bebop is to use octave displacement. And in octave displacement, what you do is you take a part of the melody and then you will shift that an octave. This is a great way of introducing some, some larger intervals and also just create some sort of surprising jumps that's gonna make this line sound a lot better. And in this case, if we take the straight note chaser motif, then that would be, of course, this. Now, if I take the last part of that, so the chromatic part, and move that down an octave, then I have this, which of course sounds quite different. And if I turn that into a line, then that could be something like this. And the last sort of bebop variation of the first phrase we can make before I move on to working with just some of the rhythmical and also some of the repetition ideas that he's using in the theme here is to change the chromatic approach. So if we take the first phrase, then uh, we have this chromatic approach from D to A. And of course I can play another type of approach there that could be something like... And then I get... And we can turn that into a line like... At the core, then, I think Strano Chaser is really the same as a lot of other blues pieces in the sense that it's just one motif, one riff that's then just moved through the blues changes. And of course, the stereotype version of this, there are a million of those, but that would be something without dissing Sonny Rollins, that would be something like Tenor Madness. So you have the... And just changing the melody so it fits the chord and in that way making clear where the chords are and everything is pretty predictable, it's just sort of a riff piece. It works fine, it's, it's really also connected to the blues tradition, I think. And that is also what Monk is working with with Straight No Chaser, except he's moving thing, things around rhythmically and he's also changing 
the melody in sort of unpredictable ways. And I think that's really just to keep it interesting and surprising for the listener. So we have this part of it where it's like, it's always the same motif, but then, then there are this many notes, then there are fewer notes. Now it's put here in the bar and now it's put somewhere else. And I think that's really sort of the elegance of what's happening with straight notes here. So for the rest, it is just one motif moved around a blues form. So if we just co cover that quickly, then this is the first statement. This is the main motif. The root is on the one and everything is kind of clear. Then we get already this version. And here the whole motif is actually shifted one B. So now sort of the, the gravity point on the F is actually on the four. So in that way it's moved within the bar. And he also kind of in a elegant way gets to emphasize the A flat on the B flat seven which is of course the one note that you want to have in there. Then he goes back to the original version to go back to F7 and plays that again, but again it's of course moved so that now the point of gravity is not on the one, it's on the four. Then we get stopping early, but then that's also giving us kind of a F7 sharp nine sound that's pulling us to B flat seven. On the B flat seven we get the same motif or the same version of it that we had on the first B flat seven, but now it's really just within the B flat seven to B diminished bar, so which means that it's actually starting on the one end, and that's also ending to give us the, the B diminished sound here. Going back to the tonic chord to F seven, he goes back to the original motif, but now it's actually turned around. So now the the two B two is is the point of gravity here. So and then that's just moving around a few times. Then we go on to the G minor seven. Again, coming out on the two, so it's a little bit like the B just turned around. And then moving into this chromatic run, which is kind of also, again, in an elegant way, really bringing out the third of the C seven, and also the seventh. So really just spelling out the changes. And then a final version of the original Theme, which is kind of sound because it's really ending on the third and and coming out really clearly it sounds really like a resolution of all these other developments of that motif. The reason that I can keep on publishing videos is that there is a community over on Patreon that are supporting the channel. I'm very grateful for their support and if you want to join us over on Patreon then I can also give you something in return for your support. The first thing to try from this is probably just to take so the basic structure of the opening statement and then try and turn that into a line. So I'm gonna to try to turn that into a two, five, one line. Of course, you can use that on whatever progression you want to, but it's just easy to work with the turnarounds, two, five, ones when you're working on this, I think. So let's do that with a two, five, one in B flat. So C minor, F7 to B flat. If you have this statement, or actually two statements, then we have one version that's first just the basic one, and then the next one is really that same thing, but then with an added tail. And we can use that on the 251 as well. So if I have to have come up with a statement that's just similar, but then on the C minor, we can do like a, an E flat major seven arpeggio. So now we have a basic opening statement that's using exactly the same rhythm. Then I want to repeat that. And then go on. And then here. I can just go into to an alter dominant, so really like the flat 13. And the good thing about working with this is that you can hear that I'm playing C minor 7, F7 to B flat, but actually the way I'm playing it now, my C minor is sort of extended into the F7 bar. And we also get this idea of the rhythmical phrase that's moving within the bar. And that makes the line a lot more interesting than just sort of running the changes and just playing some, some phrases. Here we get some another level of sophistication added to the to the basic idea here. We can also do this in a less obvious way by just developing the motif. So I have my first motif here, so... And then I can maybe turn that into a repetition that's... Which is essentially just moving it, moving it within the scale. And then again just going, so I'm using the G minor 7 arpeggio here and then just turning it into an F7 also and then resolving that. Mm -hmm. 
Another way of looking at the opening phrase is of course also that it's a phrase that's three quarter notes long and then that's sort of moved across the 4-4 the four, four meter. So we have and then that's on the one and then the next one is also with an upbeat but it's really on the four. Now we can use that to say well let's change that polyrhythm and that's really easy here because we have we have a rest at the end of the of the phrase. So we can just take that out and then we have instead of a three quarter or six eight note we have a five eight note grouping. And with the original melody that would sound like this. And that of course sounds a little bit strange, it's not as strong as the original. But that is also something you can use when you're trying to come up with some lines with it. So if we try to use that idea and then turn that into a two five line, that will sound like this. And here, I think the core principle that I'm using is actually the repetition. So the fact that I have sort of an opening statement or an opening motif, and then I'm repeating it and developing it within the melody. And I'm also doing that in a way that's rhythmically a little bit less predictable. And that's what makes it interesting to listen to. If you want to check out another piano player who's also really great with some interesting rhythmical ideas, then check out this video that I did on Bill Evans where I'm analyzing his solo on I Love You. If you want to learn more about jazz guitar and this is the first time you see one of my videos, then subscribe to my channel. And if you want to help me keep making videos, then check out my Patreon page. That's about it for this time. Thank you for watching and on to next time.